Hello and welcome. I had just recently uh, recorded two lectures on Eagleton's explanation of structuralism. And I thought, you know, I've never really been able to find a good example of an essay that technically uses the methodologies of structuralism. And some of you, and of course, some of my students asked me to provide a good example. And so then I went and looked for maybe one of the best collections on structuralism. And if you look at it, it's a huge volume edited by Michael Lane. It came out in 1970. I guess at that time, structuralism was its height, at its height. And I chose a very complex essay. So this is an essay by Roman Jacobson and Claude Levi Strauss, okay? A master of linguistics and semiotics and an ethnographer, both famous in the field of structuralism in their own fields of study. And if you look at it, the essay is about Charles Baudelaire's poem or a sonnet, uh, Les Chats, um, the cats, right? I don't know how to say it in French. You can use your French on it. And I'm not going to dwell too much on the essay itself and explain it because to be very honest, as Eagleton points out in his chapter, he actually mentions this essay in his chapter, and he suggests that here is a great example of a structuralist essay, but only a super reader would be able to read it. Only very few people will have the kind of expertise to write about a poem like this, right? And that is his point, that how specialized the structuralism becomes. So I am only using this essay to give you an example. This is how two masters of structuralism actually used what they believed in, brought their knowledges together to bear upon a 14-line poem on a sonnet. And that is the example I wanted to share. Now, I think I can share screen here and uh, see if I can bring up the essay. And so this is the poem, okay, that they are actually uh, writing about. Now, before the essay starts, the editor does, you know, put an explanation. Why is it that we are bringing two of these people together? and publishing something about a poem, even though one of them, Claude Levi Strauss, had famously derided the emphasis on the poetic function, right? So he explains that, but this is the poem that they are talking about, right? And as you read it, like as we go over the essay, they will tell us from the very start, they first go to what are the classic rules of a sonnet, right? And, and they tell us, okay, and they're already within the structure of the poem itself, right? And if I could go down to their beginning part here. So they, so here is the pattern that they are talking about, the pattern of the poem, right? And then they go, that according to so-and-so, according to Garamont, or whosoever that is, a uh, uh, rhyme scheme of a sonnet in question is a product of three different rules. And they give us these three different rules, two couplets with alternative masculine and feminine rhymes, two contiguous lines each have a different rhyme, and the final lines of contiguous verses must have alternating masculine and feminine rhymes. Now, think of it this way. Even in the beginning of the essay, they haven't started discussing the poem yet. But what they're referring to is the defined structure of a sonnet. What must it contain, right? And how everything must be arrayed. So that already tells you that this is going to be a reading of the poem 
in which its structure, right? Larger structure, what's its rhyme scheme, how the stanzas are arrayed is going to be one part of it. And within that, then, just as, you know, uh, Levi Strauss, when he describes myths, the, the irreducible unit of a myth is mythine, right? So they are the ones who form a larger myth. Similarly, in linguistics, the phoneme is the smallest and it forms the largest. It still creates a structure, right? So within that, then they are going to read the poem within its larger structure. But within that structure, the function of each part, the verbs, the adjectives, right? Uh, the modifiers, right? Feminine and masculine rhymes. I mean, it's French, so of course the verbs are gender. Uh, and what's their function in it? Uh, are there any repetitions? What do they do? So the poem is about two cats, right? <laughs> who are first domesticated, and then by the end of the poem, who have become these mythical cats who contain the universe in their eyes. That is how you, me, and everyone else will read it. And they take us there, but they take us there in the body of the essay by reading the linguistic arrangement of the metaphors, the function of metonymy, reputation, right? And the structure of the form itself. So that is why even though it's a very complex essay, it is a great example of a structural essay. So um, let's just put a single point here. The sonnet is made up of three compound sentences indicated by full stops. Each of the two quartins and the two tercets together. So there are four quartins, two quartins in the beginning and two sets, right? Three lined uh, stanzas. These three sentences form an arithmetical progression according to the number of independent clauses and the personal adverb forms in each one. So you can see this is a structuralist reading of a poem because they started with the larger structure of what a sonnet ought to have. And now within each, they are giving us how the lines are divided, how many quartins, how many tercets, right? Three line ones. And then within that, what is the arrangement of different kind of verb forms, personal verb forms, independent clauses. So they give us like one single finite verb, two finite verbs, three finite verbs. All of the engagement with the poem is on the level of technical details of language. Now, as you read this essay, you'll also find out that the technical details are on different levels of language. They are on the semantic level of language, phonetic aspects of the language, grammat grammatic aspects of the language, and then somewhat towards the end, the mythical understanding of uh, or functioning of the language itself. But the emphasis, by and large, is on macro and micro structures. And um, so they even give you diagrams, like on this page, you can see a semantic view of the grammatical subjects reinforces the parallel between the two quartains on the one side and two tercets on the other. And look at the, you know, the, uh, you know, mathematical or uh, representation of what they have studied here. Uh, Similarly, throughout the poem, even when they are moving it from, let's say, literal representations of the cat to how they become metaphorical, how they become larger than the cats themselves, they are doing it by focusing on the particular choices of words, particular choices of modifier, adjectives, nouns, verbs, they are categorizing them differently until they take us to the end of the essay. And, and I'm going to try to scroll down to the conclusion. Sorry, I'm having some problem with this file. But if, as you see, the essay is rich 
not just in the way we are used to reading a poem, like, oh, this is what the poet means. No, it's constantly reading the smallest parts of the lines and then connecting it to the whole. But the whole is the structure of the sonnet itself. So towards the end, um, when they give us their final verdict, uh, this would reaffirm. So now they have taken us by being attentive to the language, how it plays in the poem, how are the cats transformed in these 14 lines from the domesticated cats to the cats that hold the universe in their eyes through the linguistic aspects of the poem itself, right? And that is when they are now taking us. So this would reaffirm, they say, were there any need to do so that for Baudelaire, the image of the cat is closely linked to that of the woman, right? And this is the only point in the poem where they are going to another pre-existing structure and that structure is Baudelaire's other poems, which have cats who are associated with women to make a connection that this structure, this poem falls into that trajectory or that way, the way Baudelaire has otherwise also defined women. And so the last lines, this motive of oscillation between male and female in lust chats becomes evident in intentional ambiguities. Uh, Michael Butor is justified is in claim that Baudelaire's the two aspects of femininity and super virility far from being mutually exclusive are in fact bound together. All beings in the sonnets are masculine, but the cats and their alter egos are of an androgynous nature. This very ambiguity is emphasized throughout the sonnet by the paradoxical choice of feminine substantives for so-called masculine rhymes. Through the mediation of the cats, woman is eliminated from the poem's initial galaxy, leaving face to face, if not totally enmeshed, the poets, the chats freed from love and the universe unfettered by the savant's austerity. Okay, so the uh, there's also like a binary structure that they point out in the beginning of the poem between savants and lovers, right? So overall, I'm not trying to explain the essay, of course, you'll have to read it. The link will be in the additional resources below. Uh, what I'm trying to share with you is one of the most complex structural essays, but the most important aspect of it is, it is about a sonnet, which is about cats, right? But they start immediately when they start their poem, there is no reference to the poet, there is no reference to even what is in the poem, they start with, here is the structure of the sonnet that we are going to rely on. So and so has explained this must be part of a sonnet. So they're already invoking a structure. Then they take us through the poem, but first they tell us here is how the poem is structured. Two quatrains, two tristets, right? Then they point out that within that structure, six lines and six lines are separated by two lines that are completely different in their structure, right? So that is a structure within a structure. Then within each verse, they are counting the numbers of adverbs, adjectives, female noun uh, uh, verbs, male uh, masculine verbs. So the reading is completely based on the structure of language within the, within the poem. They, they actually give us the number of verbs and adverbs and modifiers used, right? as if like we can count all those. Then they are giving us a layered reading of everything. They are giving us a phonetic reading of what do the phonemes do in the poem, the semantic aspect of what, what does a word or a choice a predicate carry, right? And then finally, how do these cats become mythical 
because of the usage of language within the poem. All of this, these entire 10 or 15 pages of analysis of a 14 line poem, I think 14 line of a sonnet, is completely with reference to the larger structure of the sonnet itself. Within that, the linear, the structure of how the couplets and lines are arrayed. Within that, what kind of words are used? Well, are they adjectives, adverbs, verbs? What is their significance? How many lines have masculine endings? How many lines have uh, female rhymes? Right, And then through that linguistic study, they are telling us this is how the language used within the poem, when it becomes metaphoric or metonymic, transforms those cats into these mythical, powerful figures. And then only still emphasizing the language itself, that they're the only female noun is used in this these two lines. They are then connecting it to the larger structure of other poems by Baudelaire, where just to prove a point that cats in this poem correspond to that and are usually a representation of women, right? So by and large, if you read this essay, my point is, I'm not saying that you need to understand it and consume it to understand structuralism, that at its height, when two experts come together and perform a structuralist reading of a poem, this is what is the outcome. That is why when Eagleton talks about structuralism in a critical way, you know, he's talking about I mentioned in my previous lecture too about the need for this super reader. Where does that reader come from? But more importantly, there is no reference to the world in this essay to, you know, what kind of a world is it in which this poem was created? Who will consume it? What is its impact on the world, right? Uh, what can it do in the world, right? There is no sociality of the text itself. And so that is what at its height, in a way, structuralism becomes a deeply technical reading of the content and the structure of a poem in a way to explain how every piece works and reflects on the whole. And corresponds to a pre-established structure of a certain genre or, or a certain form of poetry. So that is what I wanted to do in this brief lecture. I hope it was helpful. Please do read the essay. Uh, the link is going to be there so that you can roughly have an essay that you can use as an example of here is an essay, which is a classic example now of structuralist analysis of a literary text. Thank you so much. That's all I have to say. I hope this was helpful. Please do send me your questions and I'll try to answer them. And as always, peace and love.